Welcome once again. I'm Imran Garda and you're in the stream. Today, Kuwait's on the boil. Is it poised on the brink of a political uprising? As always, our digital producer, Ahmed Shihabuddin, is here looking out for all your live feedback. Plenty of feedback today. Hi, Ahmed. Hey. Joining him on the couch is former U.S. ambassador to Kuwait, Edward Ghanem. And uh, with him is Professor Kristen Diwan, who specializes in Arab and Islamic politics at American University. Both of you, uh, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the program. Lots to talk about. I look forward to your thoughts. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, of course, uh, this show is all about you, our online community. So if you've got a story you want us to cover, you can share it with us on our Facebook page. Ahmed's uh, looking at all your feedback and has more on the stories that you are feeding the stream. So no to GCC deal is a new hashtag created by Yemeni netizens to voice their opposition against the controversial GCC deal. Now the deal would give President Ali Abdullah Saleh immunity in return for handing over power to his deputy. Meanwhile, thousands are still continuing to take to the streets in Yemen on a daily basis demanding President Saleh's resignation. Now this video right here shows women protesting on Monday, let's take a look, in the capital of Sana'a. Now, as you can see, the protests remained mostly calm, but this is just one of several videos that have emerged in recent days. Now, on this show, we always encourage you to send a Storify where you can curate tweets, photos, and videos to tell your own story. And today, Noon Arabiya on Twitter shared this one with us, titled Note to GCC Deal Campaign. Now, she's one of the Yemeni activists behind the hashtag. And on Twitter, one of the tweets in the Storify Nada2124 says, Saleh's war crimes is public knowledge and the GCC deal gives him a chance to go scot-free. Yemenis demand accountability. And Amira, in the same Storify, says, in the US, you need a license to go hunting. In Yemen, Saleh has the GCC deal. Now, despite indicating on multiple occasions that he would accept the terms of the deal, President Saleh has refused to sign the UN-backed GCC initiative to transfer power even after amendments were made in recent months. Now this tweet, this last tweet from Ahmad uh, Khawaga uses the no GCC hashtag right there uh, to show uh, you know, a cartoon that depicts President Saleh being measured by the GCC um, in order to find a deal that suits him perfectly. Now that's just one of the many tweets that are circulating and included in the Storify. So meanwhile for you, uh, just to know the UN Security Council was supposed to meet on Monday in a session but it's now been postponed to next week to deal with the issue. Hi, I'm Liz Janes. I'm from Portland, Maine. I'm an artist and I volunteer teaching children in my community and I am in the stream. Now a standoff in Kuwait between the political opposition and the government is continuing. It's an ongoing conflict over a multi-million dollar bribery and corruption scandal involving government officials. Let me show you some pictures from a protest uh, that took place. These are the latest pictures of protesters on the streets of Kuwait City. Opposition MPs say they're upset that Parliament blocked their efforts to question the Prime Minister about those allegations. There were fascinating pictures as well from last week. Let me uh, show them to you from uh, Parliament. Have a look at this. Uh, where protesters and activists stormed the chambers of the National Assembly building after police tried to break up the rallies. Now, the Emir, Sheikh Sabah Al Ahmed Al Sabah, denounced those actions and ordered security forces to maintain public order. And these are scenes you don't see too often in Kuwait. Well, joining us uh, now is Kuwaiti protester uh, Lama Al Fadala. She's actually at one of the protests at this moment in time. Uh, welcome to the stream, Lama. She's joining us uh, over the phone inside uh, that protest. Lama, give us an idea as to the scale of the protest and the mood of the protesters. Um, actually, it's a, it's a very positive uh, day. It's a very successful protest in my uh, view. Um, the number of protesters um, uh, was, um, I, I would say, more than a couple of thousand, more than 10,000, um, as, as said by one of the speakers or organizers. Um, but uh, the protest just ended. Um, 
the organizers had asked everyone not to go on a march um, to avoid conflicts with police, which are um, surrounding the areas, um, uh, uh, different forces, uh, with masks, with um, some um, equipment to stop or barricades to stop the protesters from um, starting the march. Um, but overall, the protest was actually very successful in my view. Um, uh, I'm, uh, the number of women was was uh, was, was big. The number of uh, um, I mean men from uh, all over Kuwait. Uh, it was a great success, actually. Lama, you say um, you, Lama, you say women and men from all over Kuwait. Is there a unifying theme amongst the protesters? What exactly do they want? Um, definitely, um, um, the main main uh, one of the main goals of the protest is to, um, people have been asking for the uh, prime minister to leave office um, based on uh, uh, more than one uh, point of, of uh, corruption. Uh, last, which was a big one, was the country um, being robbed of um, millions of dollars. Um, it's a scandal. We still don't have facts or final numbers or ideas of what it is, but it's, uh, it does involve uh, members of parliament. It involves uh, uh, money transfers, huge amounts are transferred daily outside of Kuwait. Um, so that's, that was a, a big thing that brought us to where we are today. Okay. Lama, the, the line is getting uh, increasingly sketchy and it's starting to break up. So we're delighted that uh, we got a few minutes out of you and we're going to allow you to go back to the protest. But thank you very much for giving us a taste of uh, the feeling on the ground. Lama Al-Fadala there from uh, Kuwait thank City. You. Thank well, you. Well, there you have it. Ambassador, what do you think of that? Um, you know, when we look at Kuwait from, from the outset, a lot of people go, well, Kuwaitis have a full stomach. I mean, they're one of the richest countries in the world. <laughs> uh, the, the Human Development Index is the highest in, yes. in, the, in the Arab world. So uh, people would possibly be forgiven for asking, what do these people want? But Lama seemed to define it as, as definitely against corruption and nepotism and against what they seem to, be, uh, seem, seem to think is a sort of ruling elite with no accountability. Uh, are those strong enough qualms to make a change? Well, I, I have to tell you that uh, while the issue of the moment is the corruption and, and charges, uh, allegations, because they've not been proven yet, even some members of parliament who've talked about it haven't produced the evidence yet. But, but stepping back from that, this is a country that for the 20 years since I first got to know it, uh, in the days of liberation, uh, where I was the ambassador and went in, uh, this has been a parliament or a parliamentary system where people have voiced uh, opposition and express their views of demonstrations as well uh, for all of these 20 years. In fact, I think that's a characteristic that's a strongly, um, a, a, what say, complementary of the Kuwaiti people, that they can go out in the streets, they can protest, they can speak their minds. Um, what you don't hear, let's, I think we need to put this all in context, you don't hear anybody calling for removal of the Sabah family, right. uh, and the legitimacy of the system as it is. Uh, and I think that's also very important, uh, that uh, the emir spoke to the fact that people should be able to go and demonstrate mm. in the streets and speak their mind. And, um, and so I think that what we're seeing is a focus right now on corruption charges mm. with a commitment by the government to put this before the judicial system, to do the investigations. Um, I think the pressure from the public will be on the government to do just that. Relatively speaking, Kristen, the ambassador is right. There's a free, free parliament compared to some of the neighbors uh, in the region. Uh, however, those scenes from last week, the storming of the parliament, unprecedented, uh, shocking, uh, definitely a shock to the system. And again, to reiterate, if you have about 15,000 people in Kuwait City on the streets in a country which has a population of about 2.5 million, um, it suggests proportionally a lot of people are disenfranchised, and, or not disenfranchised, but disaffected perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what's going on is that people in Kuwait really do value their parliament. I mean, this is uh, something that's very valuable to all Kuwaitis. And there's a sense that now, especially with this latest corruption scandal breaking, that perhaps they're, they're losing some of that power, some of the power of the parliament. I mean, if these allegations mm. do prove to be correct, it means that um, the government was actually paying MPs to back them and to keep the current prime minister, who's been increasingly unpopular, mm -hmm 
in power. Um, and in the latest move, the one that actually prompted the people uh, going and taking over the parliament, um, there was a sense that the opposition MPs had actually gathered the number of votes that they had to um, challenge the prime minister and to actually remove him in a vote of no confidence, which would be rather unprecedented yeah, in the Gulf right, region. Right. Um, but that a parliamentary maneuver was, was used um, and that the ruling family was able to bring in through the constitutional court and to deflect those that um, kind of grilling that was supposed to come forward. Mm -hmm. So there was a sense that maybe this parliament couldn't be used to do what it is supposed to be able to do, which is to keep accountability on the Kuwaiti rulers. Uh, I, I want to just take something you were mentioning. You were both saying that, you know, relative other countries in the Gulf, Kuwait, as parliament, you know, is held dear to the people of Kuwait. And, you know, it should be mentioned that there are women serving in the parliament as mm, well. Absolutely. Which is, you know, a, right. big, a big step in, you know, in the larger context of, you know, the Gulf's history. But we also have this tweet from Fifi's Way saying, the decision is wise. Democracy in Kuwait is a given right. The poor understanding of it should be stopped. Chaos is a big no. So criticizing the chaos we saw several days ago. But then my question to you, Ambassador, is, uh, there are no political parties, so how can you have a true democracy or real democratic mm -hmm. voices represented if there's no political parties? Well, They're banned. It, it, that, that is a big problem. And, and I think you have to recognize there are factions or groupings around individuals or around philosophies right. that do exist. Mm -hmm. And within the government, and when there have been recent elections, you often say that four of these were elected and five of those. So there are groupings. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right, there are not the political parties. And in fact, I think that there are systemic problems mm -hmm. uh, in the constitution right. uh, of the state and the way the government is organized. You have a parliamentary government, but you don't have the same parliamentary uh, powers and controls that you would think of if you think of, of uh, Britain or Canada. Right. Uh, on the other hand, you do in fact have some checks and balances, mm -hmm. but you don't have others. Uh, and an independent judiciary, uh, a strong judiciary, perhaps I should have said, is, is sort of not there too. So the system is not exactly well structured right. to deal with some of the problems, though it does give everyone ample opportunity to voice opinions. Great. Uh, we have a video question that also came in from our community because on our show we try to give them voice as well. Mm -hmm. Somewhat of a rhetorical question from Sarah Asrar, but let's listen to it and then see. Hi, my name is Sara. I'm uh, calling from Kuwait. Uh, I understand that you're protesting against the government corruption, but shouldn't the protest be more for true democracy and not just superficial reforms? So she's again asking, is this about superficial reforms? What do you make of that? Well, I think it's an interesting question for the opposition. And a lot of people do um, criticize the youth movements that have been in the street for kind of having a very narrow message of just focusing on getting rid of the prime minister and mm -hmm. not speaking to these larger issues that allow this uh, corruption to, to stay in place. But I was able to speak to a lot of the youth um, leaders. And I think there was a sense where they felt like they needed to tackle this issue first mm -hmm. and also to get Kuwaitis um, acclimated to being able to, for it being their right to go out into the street and demand these things. Mm -hmm. And they thought that once that they had that uh, kind of shift in culture, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. they would be able to push for even larger, more significant reforms. Ambassador, I understand that you travel back and forth to Kuwait quite often. I do. I do mm -hmm. out there. In fact, I was just going to respond a little mm -hmm. bit, uh, adding uh, something that, I, you know, I sometimes get very irritated at the attitude of some of the members of parliament and the way they deal mm -hmm. with things. And there have been, yes, there's been a lot of opposition to the prime minister himself mm -hmm. uh, and for over, over the years. But I've, I've known this man for the, the 20 years uh, plus. And first of all, I know he's a nationalist. I know he's a, very, a patriot mm -hmm. and, and committed to Kuwait. Um, but in dealing with the situation over the last five years, sometimes the parliament, members of parliament have challenged him, mm -hmm. actually calling for these conf no, no votes, uh, the votes of uh, lack of confidence, right. even before he was uh, officially appointed, reappointed. Uh, so, and, and so in some ways, it's, it's easy for supporters or for those who are opposed to the, say, the current uh, demonstrations to say, they just are seeking the next big issue Mm -hmm. to use uh, to get the prime minister. Well, it sounds like the Democrats and Republicans in Congress here. Uh, <laughs> I must tell you that even when I was the ambassador there, I used to say to some of the people who were in parliament, you didn't, we are supporting democracy, we support you, and we did very strongly, mm -hmm. but you don't have to copy everything about <laughs> us and what you But do. I mean, the reason I ask, you know, you, you go back and forth, you've definitely developed personal relationships with, with these players, the people that we're talking about. You, you know the emir, you know the prime minister. 
people are not calling for revolution. They're not calling, no. you know, for no. a scrapping yeah. of the whole system. They don't want the place to kind of burn to the ground and then but rebuild and let, it. Let me make it clear. I don't mean to disparage the loyalty and the patriotism right. of members of parliament either, right. Right. who have their causes. Right. Now, now, people are not calling for overall revolution. No. This is not a situation where they're saying, you know, a Mubarak out or bin Ali out or Gaddafi out. However, do you think that knowing the Emir, do you think that he's going to be willing to give them the concessions that they want because they want to grill the Prime Minister? They want to open the door to holding the Prime Minister accountable. Do you think the Emir would allow that to happen? Well, I'm not in the Emir's mind, uh, but he did speak uh, yesterday rather strongly about not uh, replacing the Prime Minister and not responding to these kinds of pressures on that point. I think he made it uh, the issue, and again, I only have news reports of mm -hmm. this, so, uh, which was something along the lines of, I appoint the Prime Minister and that should be clear to everyone. And that's the way it is uh, structurally at, at the present time. The, the storming of uh, you know, the Parliament building, uh, the Emir called it Black Wednesday. Isn't that a little bit dramatic and perhaps ominous that he's defining it like that? You know, there was a great sense of shame that he, he had about it. You know, he felt, he felt really embarrassed by it. Doesn't that, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, Ambassador, but doesn't that uh, suggest that there might be a kind of Bahrain-style crackdown on the horizon? Well, you, you did say earlier that this was a rather shocking sort of development, mm. and I think it was for him. I think it was for others. And so they're certainly responding to that particular point. Look, Kuwait is not Bahrain. Kuwait is not Yemen. Kuwait is Kuwait. And uh, I don't believe that the system today and the emir today is going to be using the kind of violence and force to put these things down that we've seen elsewhere. In fact, he, he spoke yesterday against violence, against the, that, and the right of the protesters to protest. Mm -hmm. I think there have been reports, though, however, that um, a number that there are investigating um, the individuals who went and broke into the parliament. Um, a number of the youth activists, I guess, they're looking for fingerprints and these sorts of mm -hmm. things, and a number of them have been suggested that they could be arrested. They've also talked about lifting the immunity of the members of parliament who actually accompanied the protesters in the parliament at the time, um, which suggests that they might be looking to um, prosecute them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, Ahmed, I, I saw you had an interesting uh, tweet up there re regarding sectarianism. Right. Maybe you want to call we that spoke a little up. bit about Bahrain. Yeah. Uh, there's a tweet from Rawa Badrawi saying, are sectarian divisions a source of conflict in Kuwait? Um, based on your experience, what would you say? Uh, if you mean sectarian, you mean Sunni Shia, to yeah. be very blunt yes. about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's the, the Shia in Kuwait are more integrated into society than any other country in the region. Right. That doesn't mean that there aren't um, sensitivities between the two groups and some uh, of the stereotyping that we've seen elsewhere exists. But I don't, I don't find this a major issue uh, in, in, uh, in Kuwait. And then w when we were talking about the Emir's reaction to the protests, which you were talking about, many say that the reason, perhaps 10 to you know, 15,000 people, you know, took to the streets again or went to Irada Square again today is because he was adamant about not a allowing the Prime Minister to resign and adamant about not, you know, giving in to any of the changes. Do you think that that's to be expected moving forward? Was that the, the right move to come out and say, well, no, the Prime Minister will definitely not resign? It's a bit ironic considering how many times he has resigned in the past and how many times the parliament has been dissolved in the past. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's true, but we, as you ask the question, and, and going back to an earlier mm -hmm. remark, you know, there have been votes of no confidence right. on the prime minister. As you he, said. he is the first prime minister that's ever been mm -hmm. actually voted on that way, mm -hmm. and he won the vote of confidence right. at that time. Right. Um, so I, I, we get to lose perspective here mm -hmm. right. that there are really uh, have been opportunities. But you're right, they did go to the Constitutional Court. Mm -hmm. They got a ruling about, uh, I think it was something on a technicality, in right. it, really, that if uh, he wasn't responsible for the issue being raised, then it, it, it couldn't be a vote and that and angered members of, of Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, but. Um, I think the, the government can't ignore right. protest, the protesting. It can't ignore the issues that are out there. Uh, b before Ahmed goes to uh, another video question, I, I want to address the issue of the silent majority, if mm. you like, the expat uh, workers. There's a, there's a tweet uh, that came in from Yasmina Sabawi. Uh, w I mean, it's a bit complicated because there was an uh, original tweet, which was the government heavily employs <coughs> Kuwaitis. Could this hinder calls to action? And then, you know, she says part of why the expats, the majority, must shut up. Um, 
you know, alluding to the fact that, um, Kristen, you had uh, these uh, laborers uh, on strike a couple mm -hmm. of months ago. Um, there was, uh, interestingly, a lot of attention on this because it was one of those issues a lot of people feel is underreported, the issue of, of labor conditions and, mm -hmm. and, and pay of expat workers in the Gulf. Is there any way you see the laborers' issues, who are mm -hmm. the majority in, in a way per capita, and the issues of these Kuwaitis in the opposition, is there any way these issues can converge? Well, I, th I think the labor protests were of Kuwaitis that were employed right. by the government. Mm. So it was actually, it wasn't even addressing the, right. the bigger issue of expat labor, but actually the pay that Kuwaitis that work for the government, the civil servants are. And I think that speaks to another big division in Kuwait right now. Uh, one that usually in Kuwait's referred to as a Hadar Bedou divider, it kind right. of is mm -hmm. addressed to that. Because a lot of the Kuwaitis that were naturalized, that came later, um, are more dependent on government jobs. And so if you see during the great boom that took place more, more recently, you know, with the oil prices going up and all the wealth that was spreading around, there's some sense that some Kuwaitis benefited less than other Kuwaitis during this boom time. Right. And I think that can also be playing to some degree into the protests um, as well, because it's a sense that these Kuwaitis right. are the ones that are out in the street kind of wanting to see a fair deal and less corruption from the government. We have one last question uh, from Mohammed in Kuwait, so let's take a listen. Hi, my name is Mohammed Bawak, and I live in Kuwait right now. And I had a few questions about what's going on in Kuwait right now. And uh, my question is about uh, the editorial in the Washington Post yesterday. Mm, yes. It uh, said, and I quoted that, with regards to Kuwait, that a quicker progression toward a genuine parliamentary democracy is needed. And uh, so I was uh, curious about what kind of legislation would lead to such genuine parliamentary democracy, such as the one in the Washington Post. So you're not Kuwaiti, but you might be able to anticipate. <laughs> what would you say? What kind of legislation are we looking for? Well, I mean, it, it clearly, if they're uh, permitting political parties, right. uh, so that there were at least organized political blocks with mm -hmm platforms uh, because right now it's very difficult if you're a Kuwaiti to decide who you're going to vote for because it tends to be very personal it's true it's and true. and tribal right mm -hmm. as you said in fact going back to that question about sectarian if there are splits in Kuwait it's between the the tribe well, Bedouin tribal right. and the old uh, I'll call it aristocracy for lack of a better word but right, the old right. uh, downtown business community mm -hmm. whatever right. and these splits that are very real mm -hmm. and I, I think that's one of the things that would have to take place great okay let's put this to bed for the moment we'll continue to talk Kuwait for a few minutes in the post show but for now Ahmed's going to give us a taste of some of the other stories uh, where following briefly. Yes, very briefly. We have three stories. The first is Myanmar's most prominent dissident, you might know her, mm -hmm. Aung San Suu Kyi, will run in the upcoming parliamentary elections after her National League for Democracy uh, was now ending their boycott of the country's political system. So we're definitely going to be following that story. It'll be the first time since uh, 1990, I think, that she ran. Now, this is a website that is really interesting from the University of Hong Kong. It's a very cool tool. It allows you to get a sense of the most reposted posts within the Chinese search engine or Twitter social platform called Shina Weibo. So <laughs> Sina Weibo, there you go. If you want to find out what's going on on Sina Weibo, we'll be tweeting this link out. And the last story, um, an unconventional story from Ukraine. Apparently in preparation for the Euro 2012 Cup, Ukrainian authorities are cleaning the streets and in doing so might be killing some of 250,000 stray dogs in, in uh, Ukraine. So they created this Facebook page, as you can see, which already has about 35,000 likes. So apparently, uh, people are asking that dogs stop being killed in Ukraine. <laughs> OK, so you can vote those stories up or down on Reddit. Uh, you can give us an indication as to your appetite for them, uh, depending on whether you want us to cover them or not. Uh, for those watching on, on TV, Ambassador, thanks a lot for joining us. Kristen, as well, stay with us. We'll continue this discussion for a few minutes in the post show. Thanks, Ahmed. We'll uh, see you tomorrow if you're joining us. Then tomorrow we talk about uh, the upcoming elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Stay with us. The post show is on stream.aljazeera.com.
Welcome back Thank to you. the post show for just a few minutes. We'll continue talking uh, Kuwait with Ambassador name and Kristen uh, Diwan and Ahmed as well. We'll look at uh, some more of your feedback. Uh, good that you're still on the couch. We enjoy these five to ten minutes <laughs> just to get that little bit of extra out. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting tweet uh, that came in from Lamia et al. She said, um, absolutely, regardless of the benefits GCC citizens enjoy, electing your leadership is an important aspect of democracy, which, again, goes back to my very first question to you, Ambassador, this idea that it doesn't matter sometimes if your stomach is full. A, a lot of dictators like to use this argument. Uh, they say, oh, well, you know, people are just worried about bread. They're not worried about democracy. Kuwait's perfect example that mm -hmm. people aspire to more, don't they? Yes, they do, as a matter of fact. And I think the interesting thing about this, you know, this old subject of rentier societies, right. whether if you don't, aren't taxed or whatever else, I think what comes out these days is that, in fact, people do care about how their government spends their money. That's mm -hmm. part of the corruption charges. But it's also, it's also, I think, been abused a lot. Again, Kuwait is very small. Uh, it is a city-state, uh, and so for how many of the Kuwaitis are hired by the government? Uh, so there's a lobby group from within the government mm -hmm. for higher salaries, higher benefits, mm -hmm. and they can actually bring the parliament to bear on this because all the parliamentarians, like our own members of Congress, like to do things that make themselves popular with the voters, right? Mm -hmm. So they get reelected. So, it, you know, this feeds on itself mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in many, many ways. Uh, Kristen, along those lines, not only have we seen Gulf countries in the immediate aftermath of the beginning of, of the Arab Spring or Arab, Arab revolutions, as soon as Tunisia kicked off and then mm -hmm. Egypt, we saw not only more subsidies for, for many of these countries, whether it was uh, many of the citizens of these countries, whether it was in Saudi Arabia or the UAE or, or Qatar, but also, for example, in a place like Qatar where the Emir had announced um, there'd be you know, parliamentary elections in, in 2013. Our the leaders in the Gulf in general, can we make a generic statement? Mm -hmm. Are they trying to preempt any trouble that may be on the horizon by trying to democratize uh, bit by bit? Well, I think it's very mixed in the Gulf if you look right now. I mean, obviously we had the biggest protests in Bahrain and those unfortunately have led to probably a lot less freedoms, much less freedoms now than mm -hmm. they had previously. Um, Qatar seems to be being a little bit more proactive and trying to to create this um, elected body, which would act some like a, somewhat like a parliament. Um, but I think it would probably be in the best interest of these Gulf states to get ahead of things right now and to create more political avenues for their citizens. Mm -hmm. um, now that they have, they have wealth and they have this pressure, it would probably be a good thing for them to create the institutions to allow people to have more voice. Uh, on that note, just to like extend it further, a lot of my friends who live in the Gulf or who are from the Gulf uh, tend to uh, have this idea as though they might be different than the rest of the Arab mm -hmm. world. You know, mm -hmm. the fact that they are in the Gulf and they have um, perhaps more wealth relative to some other Arab countries, um, more comforts. Um, so on that note, we have a tweet from Hybrid79, and taking that into consideration, um, they say, Kuwait has a large U.S. military presence. How does this come into play? Now, this is a question for you, perhaps. The uh, U.S. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I have to tell you, I don't think it has much, much impact at all. Right. It's uh, non-visual. It, it sits in a base south of the city. Right. They built a road from Iraq around the city so that the convoys and troops, you rarely see any U.S. forces in the city deliberately. I mean, it's just not, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think none of this that's happening is, right. uh, is really impacted yeah. by the presence of the military. That's sort of the interesting thing in Kuwait right now. It really is about domestic Kuwaiti politics. Definitely none of that. this has been so much affected yeah. by a lot of these other things. It's really about the constitutional order in mm -hmm. Kuwait. Interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and as we try to uh, define the opposition, are there any personalities any names, any particular people that uh, come to light that uh, the opposition can, can rally around? Well, you have there a couple. Are. Yeah, I mean, you have a couple of um, the most popular, or at least by vote count, uh, parliamentarian in the Kuwaiti parliament, Salman Barak, mm -hmm. heads. Um, and the most vocal in terms of challenging vocal. the prime minister. Very vocal. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, he he um, heads the Popular Action Bloc, which I think uh, speaks a lot to what we spoke about this earlier, this kind of tribal populist trend in the country. You also have some Islamist MPs who are quite popular, Walid al mm. as well as also mm -hmm. another very large presence mm -hmm. in the opposition. Mm. Um, but I think what's also interesting is there's a real struggle, I mean, for the Kuwaiti youth and the people in the street to have a voice, but they want to have that separate from the parliamentarian, parliamentarians, and that's been a big issue mm -hmm. 
of them to be able to keep their distance, I guess, from the parliamentarians and to be able to push mm -hmm. for, for their own interests aside from them. Yeah. What, what, the comment you made just reminds mm -hmm. me that I think it's worth coming, bringing out, which we haven't really discussed, which is that there's enormous backlash right. mm -hmm. in Kuwait against and the no, demonstrators right. and, this, and the parliament. Well, I was yes. just going to mention, we have a tweet from Mohammed al Mutawa saying, the problem is some members of the so-called opposition have themselves been involved in corruption. Uh, they, uh, they indeed have been, or at least allegedly. Right, exactly. And, yes. and in fact, mm -hmm. the moralism here is a bit surprising somewhat. Right. Though it's politically understand, right. but I mean, there are many of my friends in Kuwait when I go who actually ask me, "Don't you think we should just get rid of our parliament?" And this is we're obviously not suited for democracy, or whatever. And I say, "No, you shouldn't." Right. But but there is a call for get rid of these people who right. just cause problems, meaning the parliamentarians right. and whatever. Right. And and I, I'm actually pleased to hear the emir say that's not going to happen. Right. And again, I'm very surprised. The demonstrators are calling for Parliament to be suspended into elections, mm -hmm. but it won't be very many months ago when, in fact, there were people calling for mm -hmm. Parliament to be suspended, and parliamentarians and others were saying that no. would be undemocratic. Right, right. So again, what is this? This is politics, right. and people use the arguments that mm -hmm. support their case and where they want things to go, and that's understandable. Right. But of course you have had the major corruption scandal in the middle of that where yes. we now know that a lot of these parliamentarians are paid, and so right. I think that's part of the reason for calling for a new parliament too, is that there's just a sense that why should we sit down with these people who we right. know are on the payroll of the government. Well, I was just going to so. say that, you know, when compared to certain other Gulf states, you know, a lot of Kuwaitis or Kuwaitis may have or still do pride themselves on having a parliament, but the question then is, is it more effective to have a parliament that's ineffective or to have no parliament at all? <laughs> Which I think is a question. It's a debate. On yeah. that wise philosophical <laughs> note, well, Ahmed, I think uh, it's appropriate you to must close it off. <laughs> Ahmed Shihabuddin, philosopher. Yeah, right. I'll put that as well. in my Twitter status. <laughs> like Ambassador Ghanem, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, Kristen Duan, it's, it's been it's a pleasure. great pleasure as well. Uh, I'm looking forward to feedback from Lama and, and some of the other protesters. Um, perhaps they can give us uh, an idea as to how the protest you know, transpired and, and, and we can keep in touch with them and maybe discuss Kuwait again in the not too distant future. But uh, thanks once again. Good to talk Kuwait. Good to demystify some of that. Don't forget to join us tomorrow for elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Of course, it's a place in the world which has one of the highest death tolls in wartime and not wartime in recent history. It's a place that you've got to educate yourself about. I hope uh, we can help you with that. So join us tomorrow for DRC. Until then, bye-bye.